Danny. Good afternoon. Hi, Welcome Andrew. to another charge into the dim, distant past of the Neolithic. Indeed. Um, I think it's it's hard to imagine for some people just how difficult it is to find the remains of this period, uh, which is so important. You know, the big transition from hunter-gatherers to what we think of as farming, probably a mixed economy, um, a bit of farming, a bit of hunter-gathering still, but then you get these extraordinarily large monuments, and this was a, a Neolithic uh, enclosure with some beaker pottery, which we'll get to in a minute. But I, I really liked the program. Uh, there were some really nice moments. I loved um, the making of the bowl. Oh, yeah, that's brilliant, isn't it? with Maisie and and having um, seeing it full of all those berries at the end and Phil poking his big fingers in to take a berry into honey. Um, there was a lovely moment about that. And which which things stuck out for you about the programme? Um, well, actually, I really enjoyed Phil's bit, actually. It was really interesting to see how um, bowls were made. Um, Cause you kind of think, oh, well, you just sort of carve them out. It can't be that difficult. But the whole process of like, they're having to, they're looking for polladed or coppice trees, um, looking for a particular shape. And then, you know, they have to hack that down. And then they don't just um, sort of hack it, you know, carve it into a bowl. They actually, they're charring it first to soften the wood. And then one of the brilliant bits is Phil actually pre-makes some tools. He's really excited about it, isn't he? <laughs> it was hard getting him back to the trench, wasn't it? <laughs> I mean, he makes this lovely chisel and then has a go at chiseling out this bowl. Um, and I think that really brings it home, kind of, um, the idea of how organic things are um, back then, um, but also, you know, you, you have to really put some thought into making things. You don't you don't just open your cupboard and pull out your bowl to fill your cereals with or use for your cereals. Yeah. You and know, it's one thing often it. quoted that, um, you know, we, we've lost 70, 80 percent of archaeology from the past because it was made from things like wood, yeah. um, bone, leather. Um, thread, uh, all of which dissolve cheerfully on sites like this, particularly where you've got that that higher water table. Um, now you're, you know, very interested in be our finds person, if you like. What finds in this? There are few and far between. Which ones stuck out for you? Are there, are there any particularly memorable ones? Well, I mean, with a lot of prehistoric sites, you're never going to get many finds, really. Um, and that's, well, like you just said, because of the age and because the majority of stuff that's being used is organic. So really, on prehistoric sites, kind of anything you find is exciting. Um, I think there was a, a, there were a few little pot sheds, but one um, specific one was um, from the Bronze Age that was kind of in the top of the top fill of the ditches. Um, and that was a bit of beakerware. Um, and dated to the Bronze Age. So you're looking at about, well, it's kind of about, what, two and a half thousand BC, so three and a half thousand years old-ish. Um, and it's fantastic because you've got the rim. It's on, It only looks like, it actually looks like a bit of digestive biscuit. And I think a lot of people go like, oh, well, is that exciting? But then when you realise how old it is, the chances of it surviving are amazing. Um, and what's wonderful about it is, uh, is that it's still got decoration on. So, you know, you've got this idea of people um, all that time ago, you know, it's hard um, to to live. You know, you're exposed to the elements and whatever, but they've still got time to sit and decorate their pottery. And beaker pottery, often in this country, we associate beaker pottery with the, the coming of the people who knew about metals or the arrival of the knowledge of metals, specifically bronze. And beaker. The whole story of beaker pottery is a very mysterious one. It, it appears to arrive with bronze. We're not sure whether it's people coming in or the local communities evolving into this new material, but it's amazing things to find. And I love the arrowhead. I mean, if there's one object that, you know, all archaeologists rather want to find at one, one time in their life, is a flint arrowhead. Yeah. And it was amazing how subtle that flaking was. Um, and you want on other sites what have you found beaker pottery on other sites you've worked on I haven't personally 
Mm. Um, um, but, you know, it does get discovered on, you know, Bronze Age um, sites, um, particularly in kind of, you know, sort of Wiltshire area and around there. I personally haven't. I have found Bronze Age pottery. Um, but, yeah, it's it's one of those interesting ones where when you're first learning to, to look out for uh, pottery and finds, particularly on prehistoric sites, you know, that, where finds are few and far between, You've got to look for it. And the idea is like it looks a bit like digestive. It's kind of when you look at it in like in section, it's kind of really crumbly. You know, if you were to break a digestive biscuit in half and look at that yeah. um, and it's not that easy to spot. So it's always exciting when you do find one. But the Neolithic arrowhead and I mean, that's so we've got the Bronze Age pottery. But then with the arrowhead, that's a leaf shaped arrowhead. So that takes you right back to the Neolithic, right to the very time that the monument, this enclosure, and um, this causewayed enclosure was being made um, in the landscape about 5,000 years ago. So, you know, that leaf shaped arrowhead, amazing. And the other ac experts we had, we had uh, a bone chap who was amazed to find an auric. And, yeah. and what a wonderful picture Victor drew of that, this great horned animal trying a, a wild cow effectively. But I think they said in the commentary, the size of a Spanish bull, or, well, or bigger than like a Spanish bull, but three or four times the size. I mean, extraordinary. 1.8 meters tall, or about six feet tall, and they were still roaming the landscape back then. You know, yeah. can you imagine? You know, the British Isles, kind of full of wild oxen like that. You know, yeah. amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And I thought also I quite enjoyed having um, what uh, um, Carenza called the puo meter expert <laughs> um often with sites like that you you can imagine we we get it in the fields around here that where farmers have, have kept animals or human beings of dug latrines and things like that you tend to get nettles and things like that because nettles like phosphate and here we had a chap who was giving us the phosphate levels across the site and I think that was that was an interesting use of a, a piece of expertise. To, and I think at one point he was looking at the way the cattle had come in and, and left a lot of um, phosphate material, poo essentially, across the site. Um, yeah. and, and that was an interesting expert to have on. Yeah, it's really interesting. So you can actually see there is, you know, what, what he was thinking might well have been some kind of drove way. Um, uh, sort of going through the site. The report um, later that we produce um, isn't sure what date that is, but it's very clear that there is this line of phosphorus which demonstrates that there's an area there um, where um, animals are passing through uh, the landscape because they're pooing on it. <laughs> and if any of our viewers, you know, are out there wandering a field at all near them and you see some concentrations, dense concentrations of nettles, that can often be a sign of um, places where um, there have been animals being kept. Um, and then it's quite something to look up, look out for. Hmm. Um, reasons to watch this programme. For me, um, I'll start so you can have a bit of a think. Um, uh, Victor's pictures. Uh, oh, brilliant. Every time I see those, I love the tattoos on the arms yeah. and the details of the, of the man firing the arrowhead and that massive bull that he drew yeah. uh, i think there was some just brilliant victor pictures um but for you a good reason to watch this program the thing that really struck me really was just the age of this monument um so we're looking at um the carbon dates came back very roughly at about five thousand years ago um which is fantastic um and just the you know the very fact that this is one of the earliest sites excavated um, in the British Isles, you know, we're looking at about 5,000 years ago. Um, and the really fantastic thing is that there are um, a, another, or it's set off five other Neolithic enclosures within a 10 kilometre range um, down there on the Fenland, um, just outside Peterborough. Um, and so when you start to look at the landscape, you're looking at a very, very early landscape. Um, and it's the first time, really, that humans, and I think um, Phil at some point says, I think it's Phil, says something like, you know, th this is the first instance, um, the very first time that human beings become modern. 
um, because they're starting to settle down in their landscape. They're starting to farm, they're starting to use crops and farm animals um, and, and manipulate the earth to, uh, and in terms of making these causeways and enclosures. So it's the first time we see that. 5,000 years old, it's amazing. It's worth watching it for that. Uh, and finally, I think it was quite brave of us to take it on. Uh, when I look at the possibilities of that huge, massive, great landscape, uh, we could have been digging ditches all over the place and found absolutely nothing for three days. Mm -hmm. So to find those different elements from the various periods, I, I think everybody did a really great job. And it was nice to see Bridget in there um, getting slightly frustrated at times, but working away at it. And uh, I, think, I think at the end, that programme... There was something you felt we'd achieved by doing it. So that was great. Mm -hmm.